Good. Well, if you haven't already opened up your Bibles, do so now to James chapter 1. We're almost done with the chapter, folks. We've got a little ways to go this study tonight and one more next week to finish off the first chapter. Um, we'll probably pick up the pace a little bit once we get to chapter 2 because the sections are a little bit bigger, but I didn't want to uh, zip through, as you can tell, um, this uh, first chapter because there's an awful lot in there. And uh, again, tonight being no exception, what we're going to look at with this title or this study that I've titled, um, What Do We Do With God's Word? So we're going to talk about that tonight in James style. So once again, uh, fasten your seatbelts, get your hard hats on, whatever it is you need, uh, as uh, good old hard-hitting James uh, gets right to the point again, as he does so well. And speaking of getting to the point, last, last week we looked at uh, this great benefit that we have in that every good and perfect gift comes from above, down from the Father of lights, there's no turning in Him or variation, and that we discover that God gives us everything that we need to live a godly life, to live in that place of, of the perfection that really He dwells in. And in so doing, we can have great promise and great expectation of those things that uh, God has laid out for us. And as it said in verse 18 that we saw last week, that He brought all of us forth in that sense of, of almost that birthing us into a life of Christ through his word of truth. And so James is now going to continue on this thought, having really laid out for us the different aspects of our trials, that they are put into our lives, given for our own good, as we saw verses 1 through 12. And then as we finished up last week, verses 13 through 18, really that those temptations of sin uh, that do come into our lives don't have to trip us up. They don't have to disqualify us from our walk with the Lord, especially if we realize that those don't come from God. It's not God that tempts us, but uh, that we're drawn away by our own desires. And if we can face that reality and that truth, then we understand what temptation is all about, and it won't have as great of a grip on us or as big an effect. So having done that, then as we saw last week, James then starts to get into this whole idea of the word of truth, the word of truth that God has set out and by which he has brought us forth that we might be that first fruits, those kind of first fruits of his creatures. And I, I love that concept in that of all creation, of all that God had made, he put his finger on mankind and said, that is going to be mine. That is my first fruits. And we then became that not only by our created nature, but then by our spiritual nature, and that God desired to be or have relationship with us. Now, we forfeited that in the garden. We did our best to sidestep it, if you will. But that did not in any way sidestep God. He had a plan from the very beginning that made full provision even for our falling and, and failing as what happened in the garden. So through Jesus Christ, we still will be those first fruits. It's interesting that Jesus is recognized in the Bible as being the first fruits of resurrection. So he becomes that example for us, that, that one who paved the way, the trailblazer, if you will, of what it is to raise from the dead, knowing that every one of us as Christians has that to look forward to, the first fruits of resurrection. We too now walk, as Paul said, not only in the fellowship of his suffering, which we all can relate to, but also in the power of his resurrection. And for us, for the Christian, you've heard it said, if you're born twice, you'll die once. If you're only born once, you'll die twice. Being born of the flesh and also born of the spirit means you only will have to experience that physical death. When that shadow of death passes before the light of God, casting over our lives and our physical lives in that moment are finished. But then we are now freed from the mortal 
from the corruptible and we now take on incorruptible and immortality as that shadow steps away and now we see him face to face as we were created to do. But if you're only born once of the flesh, then there's a double death to be concerned with. The physical death, but also a spiritual death, which the Bible likens in many different places to that in eternal separation from the presence of God. So those first fruits that we can look forward to of being raised from the dead, even though we die physically. So then, James then wants to wrap this little section up by saying, here is how we need to prepare our hearts for the word. You're not going to be able to receive the word of God if you are not willing to be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. And as we discovered last week, uh, I, I don't know if I mentioned it last week or not, but it's obviously been said, God created man with two ears and only one mouth. Double the hearing capacity should be single the ability to speak. But we tend to get that backwards, don't we? With one ear right here and two mouths coming out this way, or however you want to picture it. I have a little bit of a vivid imagination for some reason. But isn't that, it seems like that's how some people walk around, huh? And as we mentioned that within relationships, sometimes the best thing that we can do is just be quiet for a minute and hear somebody out and let them talk it through. Be swift to hear. But especially spiritually in terms of our relationship with God and His Word, as James is setting all of this up, he brought us forth by the Word of Truth. So in the sense of that, prepare your heart by this. Be ready to listen. Open up that ear gate and take in the truth of God's Word. Don't let it be blocked by anything. Especially not your own voice speaking, which if you talk enough, eventually you'll get frustrated and angry. And the other thing we talked about was that a very often our frustration and anger comes when God's word, and we'll see it more tonight, reflects to us those places of conviction. And we don't want to face that. We don't want to stop at that moment and say, wow, I need to get this right before I do anything else. I need to straighten this out. I need to come before God and confess those sins and ask him for help to uh, enable me toward repentance. But rather, we just kind of kick against the conviction and we get angry. And that's why James says we need to be slow to wrath because why? The wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. If our anger constantly gets in the way, and when I say anger, um, don't, don't be deceived that that means ranting and raging. Because anger has very subtle forms, doesn't it? You know the old passive-aggressive kind of thing? Where, where people will just get quiet, where people will, will shut somebody else out. That, to me, is a greater violence especially within relationships, when you're basically saying, you know, you don't exist right now. That's horrendous. That's anger. That's, that, you, you may say, well, I, you know, I never get angry because you don't raise your voice. But all of us have different ways of manifesting it. And we know that when we're in that state, the righteousness of God is nowhere near our lives. And certainly we can't sense it. Now, does it change God's righteousness? No. He's always righteous. But our awareness of it, our closeness to it, our being able to appropriate his righteousness into our lives goes right out the window when we decide we're going to have our way, which is usually why we get angry, right? When we don't get our way. So this is how we are to prepare ourselves for God's word, to be good listeners, slow to speak, and I like that. Slow to speak also means think through what you're going to say before you say it, right? Let your mind be equal with your mouth because very often one gets ahead of the other and you know which is which, where we say something before we think. So be slow to speak. Think it through. Have you got those people in your lives that are what you would call someone of few words? You know, someone of few words, a man or woman of few words, you tend to listen when they talk, don't you? You tend to kind of perk up like, oh, wow, this person hardly ever says anything. I want to hear what they have to say. My brother is like that. 
He, he's a man of few words. But he always, because you can just tell, he thinks everything through before he says it. And not that his conversation is so calculated that it becomes, you know, impersonal. But there's just always little nuggets, you know. I'm talking to him on the phone, and I find myself just having to go, whoa, wait a minute, wait, stop. I got I to gotta meditate on that for a minute. It's just, it's just really, really neat. And it could be about the most simplest of things. But he's, he's slow to speak. He's a great example to me as my younger brother, a little snot-nosed kid that he is. Of course, we're both in our 50s now. It's kind of hard to say that, but, you know. And yet he displays more wisdom, certainly, than his pastor brother. <laughs> but he is that way. He exercises that. And I so admire that about him. And it's just simply that he, is, he thinks it through. And because of it, he is also slow to wrath. So getting back to what James is saying in this progression, verses 19 and 20, this is how we prepare ourselves for the word, to properly receive it. Now James is going to go on in verse 21, and he's going to give this, this replacement theory. He's already talked about being swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. The wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. But in verse 21, he's saying, he's kind of giving us, a, don't do this, but do that. Don't do these things, but rather do that. And the two things, or the three things that he's talking about here is putting off filthiness and wickedness, but receiving humility. Look at what verse 21 says. Therefore... Lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. So what James is setting up here is, okay, we've already sort of laid out what you need to do within your heart to receive God's word, but now he's giving some particulars. If there are things in your life that are clogging up or cluttering up, you're being able to to hear God speak. And sometimes we'll even go into our devotional time. We'll go into our time of reading God's word. I'm going to sit down this morning and I'm going to spend 15, 20 minutes looking over the next passage that I've been reading through. And there's still, our lives are so cluttered up with, with this filthiness and overflow of wickedness that we, we can't receive. So he's saying we need to lay that aside first. This word, therefore. Therefore, because... We want to prepare our hearts. Now that you are set up and ready to listen, therefore, you receive the word. But you need to do it a certain way. Like I said earlier, you need to put off the filthiness, put off the wickedness, and be able to receive meekness or humility within your life. You know, that word filthiness kind of is that thought that it's the places in the world that we kind of brush up against and get dirty. That's that idea of filthiness. It's almost, it's almost like the unintentional evil that we tend to get exposed to. So just walking through this world, there's filthiness that will attach itself to us, right? Do you ever feel that way? You get home sometimes after a long day at, at work or out there in the workforce or whatever, and you're just, just ready for a shower. You know, it's like you just got all of Southern California hanging on you. You know, it could be maybe an extra smoggy day or something. Well, there's a kind of a spiritual equivalent of that. Of just, just as Christians longing to be pure, just walking through the world, there's, there's that, that haze that just surrounds us and it can, it can stick to us. And we need to be aware of that and be willing to, to set that aside, to, to take a good shower, to get cleansed once again from the things of the world. But then, it's not just filthiness, but also... Wickedness. Now, wickedness is intentional evil. So that's, that's, again, our part, right? Drawn away, remember, drawn away by our own desires and enticed. And when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. That whole series that we looked at a few weeks ago. It's that same kind of thing. You, yes, there's the filthiness the world brings on, but there are those times when we intentionally walk into an evil situation or maybe conjured up in our own minds, heaven forbid. I know maybe I'm the only one here that's actually capable of that, but if that by chance has ever happened to you, you can relate. So that wickedness also tends to uh, block us 
from being able to receive the word. It's like filthiness tends to plug up our hearing. Wickedness tends to slow down our response. Right? It's, it's like so thick around us, that filthiness, we can hardly hear God's voice. But when we're engaged in wickedness, then when God's asking us to be obedient, we tend to be very slow in that approach. And pride keeps us from exposing our true self to the light of God's word. So we need to lay that aside and the, not only the filthiness, but the overflow of wickedness. And what do what instead? Receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save our souls. That word meekness, humility, strength under control. Right? It isn't being weak, but it's having that God-given strength that he enables us with. But keeping that under control and in that place of, of, of meekness, be able to receive the implanted word. Now that word receive there, receive with meekness, is the Greek word dechomai. And it doesn't just mean to passively receive like you would take something from somebody that they'd place in your hands, right? Someone's got a gift for you. And they want to give it to you, so, oh, I, very, thank you very much, and you receive it. It's not that idea. It's more of being so accepting of it that you literally want to envelop it or take it in. And the best analogy I could think of is, is a good meal, right? You come into the house, afternoon, man, I'm hungry. And the wife has been at the stove, got a good dinner ready for you. She puts it up on a plate for you and sticks it in front of you, and you just sit there for the next 45 minutes and stare at it. You've received the meal, right? It's right there in front of you. You haven't pushed it away. You got the fork and the knife and the spoon there all ready to go, and you just stare. That's not the kind of receiving that James is talking about. Receive the implanted word with meekness. He's saying, get the fork, put it into that food, and take it in. Make it part of yourself part of you. Receive it in that way. And do so with meekness, not with pride. Pride will keep us from God's word. Meekness will draw us to it. But it's not just his word. Notice it says implanted. I find that interesting because the fact of the matter is we do not receive God's word naturally. It is not native to our hearts to receive his word. It has to be implanted in us. We need to be teachable. We need to have our ears and hearts open. We need to welcome his word with open arms. We need to be like the Thessalonians and the Bereans. Paul said of the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 1, 6, and you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in with much affliction, in much affliction, with joy of the Holy Spirit. And then later in chapter 2, verse 13 in 1 Thessalonians, for this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. So these commendations to the Thessalonians because when Paul was there in town for a short period of time, they received that word and they believed it for what it was, not just words that Paul was speaking. But they realized these are the inspired words of God by the Holy Spirit. Paul takes it a step further when it meant what actually they are mentioned in Acts chapter 17 verse 11, the Bereans. And he takes it, it, it gets taken a step further where it says, the Bereans were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica. Because in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. So here's a good example. The Thessalonians received the word, they believed it. The Bereans took it a step further and not only received it with gladness, but they enveloped it. They ate the meal. They got into the word themselves and said, wow, this is amazing stuff. And it wasn't that they were trying to prove Paul wrong. It was more that they wanted to know more of that truth. They wanted to see it line up with their own lives. So they 
receive that word with all humility and meekness. And like I said earlier, God is going to put that there. It's not that it'll come naturally to us. I don't know if any of you had the opportunity to read the Bible before you were a Christian. Most of you probably didn't because it was the furthest thing from your mind. I was raised in the church, so I already knew God's word, and I did my best to go wayward for 10 years. And during that period of time, once in a while I'd pick up my Bible, and I was the furthest from having my heart regenerated. And yeah, they were those good old stories from my Sunday school, but they did nothing to affect or change my life. It wasn't until I came to God in repentance and asked him to forgive me, and for the first time as an adult, as, a, as, a, as in that age of accountability for myself, I accepted Christ into my heart. And all of a sudden, I started reading his word, and man, it came to life. It all made sense. It, it, it was, I don't know if it was like Paul's experience, but I imagine something like it. That which he had learned his whole life, his whole younger years, all of a sudden was just converged into something that made sense. Yeah, it was. That whole testament is about Jesus Christ. He did fulfill it. It all makes sense now. And he was able to preach it with great conviction because he had taken in the word. So, the soil of our souls has been prepared there in verse 19 and 20. And then the seed of the truth has been planted, as we just read in verse 21. And those smothering weeds of anger and filth and wickedness have been uprooted... But God's word has still not borne any fruit in our lives. So, what is the proper response? Now that we have our ears open and ready to hear, and we have set aside or eradicated from our lives anything that's going to block or clutter up receiving his word, our hearts are in a place of meekness, and we're ready to receive that word which is able to save our souls, but there's still no fruit. So what do we do? What is our response to that? Well, in the next verse, James gives us what I think is probably the key verse of the entire book. As a matter of fact, I base the title of this series on that verse. And what we've titled the series is Putting Feet on Your Faith. And in verse 22, he lays out for us his entire thesis, his theme. But... Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Simple verse, just a few words, and yet one of the most profound things in the entire book, from which this place James will now build on for pretty much the rest of the letter. So, get yourself in a place to receive with meekness the planted word, which is able to save your souls, but... See, he's not saying and. He's not saying this is a continuation of that same thought. He's putting a roadblock right there. Right? The red light just turned red. <laughs> the light just turned red. We're all to stop for a minute and realize he's giving us something different. Because all along he's been going on this idea of listening and receiving and taking in the word. However, but it cannot stop there. That can't be all there is, because even though listening to the word is extremely important, it's not enough. Absolutely not. Because those who hear without doing may be guilty of fake faith. Hear me out there. Those that hear without doing may be guilty of fake faith. You know, the, the church, unfortunately, is full of those that are hearers only. So James is saying, be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. If you think that all you need to do is take in God's word, and it stops there, then you're in a place of self-deception. Then you're like the Dead Sea, who has the, the magnificent Jordan River. Well, it's not all that magnificent. It's kind of muddy and narrow. <laughs> at least in this day and age. But the Jordan that flows into the Dead Sea and fills this massive body of water. Dead Sea is a lot bigger than the Sea of Galilee. 
and yet it has nowhere to go. There's no outlet, which is why it's called the Dead Sea, because all of those minerals that are naturally in the water make their way down to the Dead Sea and stop there, and the sun evaporates all of the H2O out of it and leaves the minerals behind that concentrate more and more and more to the point where nothing can live in it now. As a matter of fact, when you go to Israel, one of the highlights is to get on your swim trunks and bathing suit and go float in the Dead Sea because you can't sink in it if you try. It's that dense and concentrated. And it's dead because it has no outlet. It only takes in. And it doesn't matter for any lake how beautiful a spring that cascades down the mountainside to fill it if it doesn't have a way out it too will become stagnant in every way. So our lives. So those of us that only take in the word and don't do anything. It's kind of like somebody that audits a college course. Now, if you've ever audited a course, don't be offended here, but here's the reality. Courses are offered to students that pay tuition and that are expected to do certain things. Take tests, write a paper, attend class, prove that they've learned something. But an auditor can pay a smaller fee and just show up. He or she has no requirements. They're all options. You want to take a test? Great. If you don't, you don't have to. Write a paper? They usually don't. Attend class? Eh, when you feel like it. They are not those that were there to, to learn, but just to take in just to hear. So, if thinking that hearing only gets us further in the Christian life, what is James saying here? We deceive ourselves. Again, we'll maybe bring it a little closer to home. It's the whole idea of eating without exercising or putting out any kind of physical energy. I know not, every, not all of us exercise. It's not sometimes easy to get to the gym or to walk around the neighborhood or from the car to the store entrance. <laughs> we try to get the closest spot, don't we? Why? So it's too far to walk. So we take in, but we don't give out. Amy Grant, years and years ago, had a song called Fat Baby, Fat Little Baby. I think that's what it was called. And it was just that, and, but it was a spiritual thing of just, just going to every Bible study and taking in and just becoming that fat little baby spiritually, but never going out to share faith or to exercise what you've been given, to be a doer of the word. And what James is saying is you keep that up, you basically are deceiving yourself in every way. Now, deception is one thing, but self-deception that's a pretty scary issue. Think about it. To be deceived by somebody out there, we can all get taken, right? We've probably all been taken at some point by some kind of deception. Infomercials are great. You see the product there on TV and just send, you know, call right now and give us your card number. And not only that, you call now, you'll get two or six of them for the same price. And then we'll throw in who knows what else. And the stuff arrives at the door, and first you're suspect because it's in a box about this big. That whole thing can't be in there. And you find out it's, it's not what you thought. And yet when you go to complain and figure, wow, I need to get my money back, you'll find out that there's that fine print thing that plays at the end of the infomercial that discredits any right you might have to try to get your money back. Now, they don't all do that, I know. But, you know, we've all been taken. So there's things out there that deceive us. But what is it for us to deceive ourselves? That's a little scary, right? I mean, we all know ourselves pretty well, don't we? Hopefully. Sometimes we would like to imagine ourselves a little better than we actually are. We might paint a little brighter picture for ourselves than what's actually there. You know, there's three aspects of all of our personality, right? There's the person that we think we are. And there's the person that others think we are. And then there's the person that God knows we are. And that last one is about where the rubber meets the road. But everything leading up to that, we can kind of get, eh. You know, deception, it's that word 
Parla, ala, no, I'm going to trip over this one. Never mind. It's a Greek word, <laughs> and it's a long one. Now, I should try at least, huh? Paralagizomai. Paralagizomai. What does it mean? I have no idea. No, it means to beguile. It means to reckon wrong or to miscount. Para, you probably recognize that from Spanish, right? It means with. And that second half that I tripped all over basically means insincerity. So it's, it's with insincerity is, is really the kind of the literal meaning. But it's that whole idea. Let's put it in simple terms. To me, deception is something that looks one way and it's actually something else. Isn't that deception? It looks one way, but the reality is it's something else. As they say, if it's too good to be true, probably is. Right? And we've had some harsh examples throughout history of places of deception. In World War II, Hitler, they called it something else and made it sound so kind of palatable because it had a big word to it. They called it propaganda. But the whole idea was, and Hitler literally said, if you tell someone a lie often enough, they'll believe it. And he was right. Because his main deception was that the whole reason Germany and the rest of Europe was going in the tanker economically was because the Jewish people were holding all the money. They had the bank control. They had the ability to make loans for very high interest. And you know, a portion of that was true because the Jewish people were very, very good with money and frugal and wise. But yet Hitler found a way to turn all of that on them and convince many, many people that that was the problem. So it was easy for folks to turn a blind eye to what was going on, and many of them didn't know what was happening in terms, in terms of the Holocaust and what was called the final solution. But it was an incredible deception. It looked one way. The Jewish people are what are dragging this nation down. The reality of it was that Hitler himself had a vendetta and a hatred and was able to convince a couple men high up in his uh, cabinet, if you will, that carried the whole thing out. And as they say, the rest is history. It was tragic. Absolutely. But that whole idea of deception. Now, now we're look, talking about deceiving ourselves. So it's, it's one thing when it comes from the outside. But when it comes from the inside, I mean, if we fall prey to some kind of deception, but what about us convincing our own hearts that we're doing well, that, that hearing is fine, that's all we need to do. That's all we need. James is saying, no, it's not. And then he goes on to give two examples, two illustrations, a positive and a negative. And he starts here in verse 23. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. So first, the negative illustration. These are basically two kinds of Christians that tend to show up for church. Those that are hearers only and not doers. Those that come in and feel like when they've sat under a, in a study and looked at God's word together, that that's good. That's, I've, I can put a hash mark now on my little list or hashtag, whatever. You know, I've done that. And, and you can walk away from here thinking, I'm good. I'm okay. That's why James is saying you're deceiving yourselves because you're kind of like that, that man that observes his natural face in a mirror and then as you walk away, after observing yourself, you completely forget what you just saw. Now, we have mirrors in our homes, right? The mirrors that James is talking about probably were like polished metal, very often brass, and I don't know if you've ever worked with metal, especially thin metal. It's real hard to get it flat. So you can polish it up real nice, but if you've got some warbles in there, you might look at yourself, and you may look like something out of a haunted house somewhere, you know, where they have the mirrors that are all warped and everything. 
So he's actually even not going from as accurate a a description as that we have. With our mirrors, which is simply glass with a very thin layer of silver behind it that causes the reflection. You know the, 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 the trouble with mirrors? It only gives back what you put in it. And it gives back exactly what you put in it. So James is saying, you're kind of like the guy that wakes up in the morning and kind of looks in the mirror and the hair's going this way and there's slobber coming off of the side here and the eyes are still caked with all kinds of interesting stuff and who knows what else. And you give it a little smile and there's still lettuce in the teeth there from the night before. And you look and you go, looks good. And you walk away. I can live with that. I think the rest of the world will accept me just fine like this. Now we look at that and go, that's ridiculous. I mean, why even look in a mirror if you're going to do that? I mean, isn't what the mirror's for is to remind you? And as you get older, folks, doesn't it remind you? <laughs> oh my goodness, what happened there? I still find, you know, when I look straight on, I'm still, I still kind of look like me. But when I go sideways, it's like I'm my father all of a sudden. Where, where did that profile come from? Goodness. Well, you've heard me say this before, right, about checking your weight. A mirror is the best thing to check your weight, right? Don't get on the scale. That's ridiculous. What you need to do is, is get down into your skivvies and get a stopwatch. And just get it to a full-length mirror and go like this and hit the stopwatch. And when you stop jiggling, hit it again. Right? Oh, I guess I'm about 10 seconds. That's not good. You know, my wife says that always, too. You know, you don't get on the scale. It's how you look in your clothes. That's what determines your weight. Right? It's, it's that mirror. The mirror is telling us. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Please lie to me today. Please. And, and the only blessing in all of it is that, at least when I wake up in the morning, I don't have my glasses on, and God's having my vision go kind of proportionate to everything else that's sagging. So when I look, it's just a big blur anyway. All right, I guess it's okay. I think that's kind of God's little sideways blessing. He has our vision go so that we can't see what's really going on. But here we are staring at this mirror. I have no idea why I went in that direction. But James is trying to say, this is what a hearer only is like. He, he looks at that, and notice it says he looks at his natural face. Now, I find that interesting because James wrote this a little under 2,000 years ago. And already then he has to mention, oh, by the way, it's someone that's looking not at a painted up face, not at something that's been fixed, but their natural face, the face that God birthed them with. That's what they're looking at. No nipping and tucking, no Botox, no lift here and there or plastic surgery or whatever, but just that natural face. And in looking at that, you go away and you forget exactly what it looked like. That natural face. You know, it's kind of like our natural birth as opposed to our spiritual birth. And what James is saying here is, what is the mirror that's being held up for us as Christians. Again, it's, it's the, the brilliance of God's word. As we look into it and we see ourselves and we just kind of look and see all of our faults and failures and walk away and, and say, I'm fine. I'm doing okay. What? I'm lining up. How we deceive ourselves. How, in a sense, ridiculous is that? And yet, how often do we do it? You know, a mirror doesn't lie. But God's word doesn't lie either. It shows us exactly who we are in the light of God's holiness and righteousness. And if we see ourselves in that mirror or God's word, and if we do it by our own standards, then we'll always look okay. We'll always be right. But again, we'll be be deceived. You see, if, if, if you have determined the way you look in the morning with everything going in five different directions is okay, and you're content with that, now you've set a standard, right? That's good. That's acceptable. In the same way, when we read God's word and we set our own standards against God's word, we'll be in trouble from day one. We will be deceiving ourselves. 
It's like the missionary who was out there in the bush in Africa, and he had hung a little mirror in a tree by which he was shaving himself. And the witch doctor of the village came over, was quite fascinated with this shiny thing that was hanging in the tree. And he, he kind of waited until the missionary had done shaving, and while it was hanging there, he went over, and he kind of lined up with it for a second, and then he jumps back, and he goes to the missionary right away and gets any bits of money he can. He wants to buy that thing that's hanging in the tree. And the missionary's wondering what on earth and why. And he said, no, 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 you can just have it. It's okay. I have another one. No, I need to pay for it. And we find out why because he went over and grabbed that thing off and smashed it on the ground as quick as it could. And he looks down on it and goes, you will not make an ugly face at me again. <laughs> He'd never seen his own reflection. Never realized what all that paint on his face and everything else really looked like. You know, one th good thing, as I said, is that when we look into that mirror, it gives us back exactly what it's given. Can you imagine what it'd be like for us to get up one day and look into a mirror and see God's reflection in that mirror? Hey, I think we'd be on our knees quick, wouldn't we? If suddenly what was looking back at us was his absolute holiness and perfection and majesty, purity and love and grace and mercy. And we tried to somehow match ourselves to that? Uh, we'd, be, we'd be going fixing things up real quick, would we not? Like the man observing himself goes away and immediately, immediately forgets what kind of man he was. It's like Sitting in a message like this, or Pastor Jack teaching, or as we had Pastor Dan this morning, did a wonderful job dividing God's word. And you're sitting there, and, and there's those moments, those twinges of conviction, right, that kind of grab you, and you think, oh, that was kind of rough. And then you get up and you walk out, and by the time you hit the back doors, you're thinking, all right, time to eat, brunch, let's get going here. And you completely forget what kind of, Man was just exposed to you, or woman was just exposed to you in that message, in that service. What are you doing? And that's what happens when you're not a doer, when you're not willing to do that. James pictures a man who glances at the scriptures and looks at the words on the page and then closes it and goes his way, feeling good about those accomplishments of keeping our reading habits. Oh, I read the Bible today. However, forgetting what God said about his condition. If we are not willing to make God's word a milestone, it'll become a millstone. It'll drag us down. It'll become the very thing that reflected to us will show us our places of sin. So we need to be willing to be a hearer of the word, but we also need to be a doer. So... For example, if you're sitting there reading one morning and you come across this passage, for if any of you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive your trespasses. And later in that day, there's a situation that comes up at work where someone wrongs you. I mean, maybe even severely. And... There may be words back and forth, there may be issues, and suddenly there's that potential for a grudge, and now there's going to be an enemy at work, somebody you're going to have to avoid every time you walk through the door. But you've just read, if you don't forgive men their trespasses, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you if you do, but if you don't, He won't. If you're going to be a doer of the Word, what should you be willing to do? One word, right? Forgive. Forgive. Right? How about, how about this one? Therefore, if you bring a gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Well, how can you be a doer of the word there? If you just read that and go, wow, that's, that's pretty good theology right there. Jesus, there in the Sermon on the Mount, you hit that nail on the head. But the next time you're in church and you're worshiping and raising your hands and you suddenly realize that you do have an ought with someone else. And it could be 
a brother in the church or a sister in the church. And you've never settled that. You've never reconciled. You've never gone over and apologized and asked for forgiveness. Jesus is saying, then your worship is worthless. Go take care of that first. Go do the word. Go do it. So then in James, in verse 25, I lost my place. My Bible should just fall right open to that part. He then goes to say what we should do. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in all that he does. So now he's giving the how. This is one thing I love about James. No matter how hard-hitting he is on a given moment or a given subject, he gives you the how, how to do it. Look into the perfect law of liberty. How to be a doer of the word. That word look, he who looks into the perfect law of liberty. It's the idea of peering. So it's not like I'm standing up here and I can see all of you pretty much at once just by kind of scanning back and forth. But it's if there were a fence built in front of me. And there's that knot hole. And I want to see what's on the other side. I've got to walk up to it with intent and I've got to peer through that small spot to be able to see what's revealed there on the other side. That's what James is talking about. That's that word, he who looks into the perfect law of liberty. Now, this perfect law of liberty, what is it? He doesn't say. He just assumes that we know what that is. Because if you look into this law of liberty and continue in it, and you're not a forgetful hearer, in other words, take it in and just walk away, but you're a doer of the work, you're going to be blessed in all that you do. So it's kind of important to understand what that law is, wouldn't you say? Well, Jesus gives us that. And it's simply this, as he was speaking to the lawyer there. In Mark 12, 29, Jesus answered him and said, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So what's the perfect law of liberty? Love God and love everybody else. Love God with everything that you have and love everyone else. When was the last time that you woke up in the morning, got ready for work, did your devotions, hopefully, but before you left the house, this was your prayer. Lord, help me today to love you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And help me to love those around me the way you do. It's a good prayer to start your day with, isn't it? Because we'll be fulfilling that law of liberty. So what James is saying is those that look into this, the man who looks at the word and he thinks deeply, he obeys willingly, he responds positively, and he also abides in those principles, then the promise to that man is that he will be blessed in what he does. So we need to go out and do. That's how we prove our faith. A little later on in chapter 2, James is going to talk about our faith without works and the fact that it's dead. So he's setting that up here already. You can't just take in the word. You have to go do it. So when the Bible says... Go out into all the world and preach the gospel to all nations. When the Bible says, lo, I'm with you always, even to the ends of the age. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. For I will be with you till the end of the age. Is that good stuff to hear? Sure. But those are all do things, aren't they? Those are all commands. Those are all things that Jesus is telling us to do. And if we don't, we're deceiving ourselves. But this guy, the one who continues 
in this law of liberty and is not a forgetful hearer. See, I love what James does. He's saying we need to be a doer, but don't forget what you heard, what you learned, because one is going to reinforce the other. When you eat and then you exercise, you get hungry so you can eat again. And then you exercise, and I can go on all night, but you get the point, right? It's a cycle. It's a circle, the circle of life. I don't know. It's that thing that just the, the way God has set it up, and it's spiritually the same. Have you found yourself maybe not being all that hungry for the word? I can give you a reason why. Because you're not giving out. You're not allowing yourself to get hungry, to empty out a little bit to get a few of those hunger pangs going again. You've just been taking in, taking in, taking in. Go out and exercise. Go out and, and exercise your faith and do the things. And like I said, those examples I gave you were not necessarily about evangelism, but they're about maybe forgiving a brother or maybe just being obedient to God in the things that you're doing in your everyday life. It's kind of like going into a restaurant and the server walks up to you and says, can I take your order, please? And you say, no, I'm just here to read the menu. Now, he's going to think one of two things. Either you're the health inspector or you're nuts. Why would you sit in a restaurant just reading the menu? I mean, it's one thing, okay, they have it posted out there. You can read it there. If you like it, you don't. You go someplace else. But you're actually sitting at a table. You're taking up space. And the way it works around here, by the way, not in Europe. In Europe, you can sit somewhere for hours. No one will bug you. They, meals take decades there to eat. It's wonderful. You, it's like it's a whole process, probably in South America as well, right? I mean, it's there. It's like it's, it's fellowship. But here, it's no, you get in and you get out. We need your table. What party of 10? You've got to be kidding me. All right, we'll put them together, but you've got to be quick. And they hurry you along. So if you're going to sit there and just read a menu, you're going to get booted out of the place. You're not being a doer, are you, of the restaurant. <laughs> you're just being a taker in or you're being a, a hearer. So we need to be willing to look into God's word and have it change us, have it move us. We will not do what we don't believe. Or as I've heard it put once, and bear with me here, we will only believe the parts of God's word that we are willing to obey. That's profound. Think about it for a minute. We will only believe the parts of God's word that we are willing to obey. Are there parts of God's word that you're not willing to obey? Then you don't believe it, do you? You don't believe it's true. You don't believe God knew what he was talking about. But if, and I'm not saying obey, because we falter in everything, but at least being willing to obey, then we're saying, yes, I believe this. Yes, I trust that God knows what he's talking about. He's in control, and I'm going to do my best to do what he says. You know, the Christian life is always being lived in the present tense, isn't it? We can't count on yesterday's blessing to get us through. Well, Lord, I prayed yesterday. Uh, I read two weeks ago, and I think I remember Pastor Jack's sermon from last week. Do you guys, by the way, remember Pastor Jack's sermon from last week? I know, huh? That's what James is talking about, being a forgetful hearer. We, we, can't tend, we tend to not even be able to link one week to the next. However, <laughs> what James is saying is we need to be here in the present. We only have right now. What did Jesus say in John 15, 4? Listen, this is all present tense. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. See, that's all present tense. It's all happening now. We can't abide in Christ four years ago and figure that will get us fruit until we die. We need to daily, moment by moment, stay grafted into that vine and be that branch that he can produce fruit out of. The promise is that man will be blessed in all that he does. And I love that because no law can stand against the fruit of the Spirit. Paul said so. And being blessed is a promise from God. Listen in closing what it says in Psalm 1 verse 3. 
those that abide in God's word. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf shall also not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. So the life of the doer is a good life in Christ. Now, there may be lifestyles that are easier, but they're not better. Being a doer of the word is a good life. And when we do that, we become part of God's created process in which knowledge followed by obedience brings more knowledge. I know that's kind of heady, but think about it. Knowledge, having God's word in our head, that's followed by obedience, being a doer of the word, like I said earlier, gets us hungry for more knowledge and gets us empty enough to receive more. Truth acted on brings more truth. So my encouragement to all of us is to be a doer of the word. We get a lot of hearing, right, here at church. But when you stand up from this pew here tonight, I guess the real question is, what are you going to do with God's word? Amen? Lord, thank you for, again, speaking to us through this letter of James. And, uh, Lord, this section where he really does lay out his full intent for his letter. And how I know it broke James' heart to see the early church, still in its, its, its infant stage, already becoming somewhat lethargic, already taking in more and more and more and not, giving out. Lord, here we are 2,000 years later and your church is still alive because you've enabled it to be so. And your word is still as true as the day it was given. And the truth of what we learn tonight is still just as vital. We need to be doers of the word, not hearers only. Because in that, we deceive our own hearts. So help us, Lord, to be clear of that and to walk from here tonight and maybe to ask a simple question. Lord, what would you have me do? Or is there something, Lord, in my life right now that's, that's blocking my being able to receive your implanted word? Is there some filthiness or wickedness from the world? Have I been angry? Maybe you need to take some time and ask the Lord to forgive you and cleanse you from those places of unrighteousness and have him clear that path for you again and bring purity to your heart to where you can not only receive his word with meekness, but then go and do. Lord, we can't do any of it without your Holy Spirit. So I pray that even as we sing this last song, your spirit would fall upon us, Lord. For all that hunger and thirst for your righteousness. And may we be so because we've been exercising that which you've told us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand.